So welcome to the first of what we hope will be a series of research presentations designed to explain and clarify the accumulated knowledge of Parkinson's and the direction in which the knowledge is going. Um, we are inviting scientists, clinicians and other experts to share their thoughts with you. Um, I'm, I'm not a scientist, but I do have Parkinson's. So like you, I'm looking for a deeper understanding of the condition. And so we are delighted um, that so many of you are joining us for a talk on what is fundamental to our health, sleep. So many people with Parkinson's find sleep is, elu is, el is an elusive necessity. Um, we're very fortunate that we have two very distinguished experts at our webinar today. They'll be able to tell us what, what research, where research into sleep is right now, the hot topics and what this means for the sleep deprived person with our Parkinson's. Our two experts are David, uh, Dr. Guy Leishner, I hope I spelled that correctly, and Dr. David Breen. Dr. Le Dr. Leishner will be, start, will be taking the first section and I'll just give you a little bit of introduction to him. He studied at Oxford, Imperial College and holds a PhD from Cambridge. He's an experienced communicator with broadcast on BBC Radio 4, BBC Radio, um, and also completed a program on sleep for Channel 4. His latest book, The Nocturnal, the Nocturnal Brain, Nightmares, Neuroscience and the Secret World of Sleep, is out now. And, and after him will come David, Dr. David Breen, but I'll introduce you um, at that time. So, Doc, so Guy, can I hand over to you, please? Yes, thank, thanks for that introduction, Ruth. If you want a job as my agent, <laughs> come and drop me an email afterwards. Um, right, so uh, uh, hello everyone. I'm going to be, th these two talks are going to be divided so that uh, I'm essentially going to be discussing some of the sleep disorders that afflict everyone, not just people with Parkinson's disease, but uh, in some cases seem to afflict people with Parkinson's disease with uh, a little higher frequency and therefore are of significant relevance to people with PD. The, the um, second presentation, which is by, by David, is going to be more focused on um, the changes in sleep that occur in Parkinson's disease and uh, the uh, resulting impact of some of the symptoms of Parkinson's disease on sleep in general. I think that's really how it's going to be divided. So I, I, I'm going to be talking, as I said, about the primary sleep disorders. Um, so I think the first thing to say is that, of course, sleep problems in Parkinson's disease are common. They're common in the general population, even in people without Parkinson's disease, particularly as we get older but they seem to be significantly more common in association with Parkinson's disease uh, than uh, perhaps uh, individuals without Parkinson's disease. And if one looks at surveys of people with Parkinson's disease, either in the community or in individuals who are being seen in hospital, the rates of uh, complaints of sleep problems is extremely high. So uh, up to about 60% in, in people in the community and up to about three out of four individuals who are being seen in the hospital setting. And uh, these sleep disturbances take up different forms. So the, the major complaints, the commonest complaints are of difficulties maintaining sleep. So people who say, well, I don't have any difficulty getting off to sleep, um, but I, I do have a particular problem staying asleep in that my sleep is very disrupted, it's very disjointed, and I'm up a lot at night for whatever reason. And this is uh, extremely common in Parkinson's disease, occurring about twice as often as in individuals without Parkinson's. But there are other forms of sleep disturbance as well. A lot of individuals with Parkinson's disease will complain of abnormal movements in sleep, so shouting out, lashing out, or, or crying out uh, in the middle of the night. And a major problem for uh, some individuals with Parkinson's disease is marked daytime sleepiness. So sometimes that can manifest as a uh, ongoing sleepiness throughout the day, but in other individuals that can manifest as, as, as frank sleep attacks. So these are individuals who will suddenly be overcome by uh, urge to sleep uh, and it will be irresistible. They will nod off to sleep and then will wake up a short while later. So I think the, the first, sorry, I'm getting a, a, um, a request for admitting somebody. Is, is that something that I should answer or? Oh no, feel free to ignore those. Okay. I'll be on top okay. of those. Thank Good. you. Okay, so, so, so I guess the obvious question is, well, why should we care? And uh, I, I think Ruth already alluded uh, to this. 
uh, in that sleep is fundamental to all aspects of our waking lives, whether or not we have Parkinson's disease. And uh, as with uh, individuals without Parkinson's disease, poor sleep has a number of knock-on consequences. Firstly, in terms of quality of life, it affects various aspects of, of cognition, mental performance, vigilance, um, but it also has marked impact on, on mood and anxiety levels. We know that there is an intimate association between sleep and sleep disturbance and uh, 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 mood as well as anxiety levels. Uh, so that relationship is bi what we term bi-directional. If you have low mood or you have high anxiety levels, that's going to influence the quality of your sleep. But equally, uh, poor sleep itself will in influence those uh, features of, of daily life. And, and perhaps uh, very importantly, poor sleep has a, a, a significant impact on daily functioning, things like driving, which is a major issue for, for people with Parkinson's disease anyway. So what about um, specific to people with Parkinson's disease? Well, I've already mentioned that one of the major complaints is of people lashing out or shouting out in the middle of the night. And so there is that risk of injury to oneself or to, to one's bed partner. We also know that there are features of sleep and sleep disturbance that may hold some prognostic value. So they may be predictive of Parkinson's disease, but they may identify certain subgroups of Parkinson's disease as well. And then the third uh, issue that is specific to Parkinson's disease is this concept of sleep benefits. So this has been described in a proportion of people with Parkinson's disease in that Having a, a decent night's sleep results in an improvement in motor symptoms of Parkinson's disease for a period of time that can range between a few minutes and a few hours. And so it seems that for a proportion of individuals, sleep in itself is a very good treatment for the motor features of Parkinson's disease. And the, 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 the rates that have been described in the literature are anything between one in 10 individuals and up to half of individuals experience some benefit on their Parkinson's disease by sleep. And so it would seem sensible that if you do have Parkinson's disease and you have sleep disturbance, addressing that sleep disturbance may in itself directly influence your control of the Parkinson's disease, at least the motor manifestations. So I think I'm going to start the, the, the meat of this talk by showing you a, a really fundamental and important seminal piece of medical literature. Um, and that is, if I can get it working, is this. So this is, I don't know if you can hear this at all. Can you hear anything coming through? No. No. So this is a, uh, a, a scene from uh, Cinderella, 1950s. In fact, 1950. And it's the king dreaming of his grandchild who is yet to be born. He's still wondering about marrying off his son. And he is dreaming and playing with his grandson and then tumbles out of bed in a confused manner. This is another scene from the same film. This is Lucifer, the villain, and his enemy, Bruno, the dog. And Bruno is falling asleep on the, is asleep on the kitchen floor, is dreaming of chasing Lucifer and uh, uh, catching him. And... So, so the reason why I say this is seminal is because this film was made in 1950 and what it describes or what it illustrates very nicely is a, a condition called REM sleep behavior disorder where individuals act out their dreams. It, it, it's important to remember that REM sleep behavior disorder, this condition was really only first described in animals in the medical literature about five years after this film came out. And it was only characterized, uh, uh, given a formal diagnosis in humans in 1989. So, you know, several decades after Disney first described this in his film. So either um, Disney was a very good neurologist or was a very keen observer of nature. Um, what, why is this of relevance in Parkinson's disease? Well, first of all, it's worth illustrating precisely what this is. So REM sleep is the stage of sleep. Uh, which is most associated with dreaming. Now, we do dream in other stages of sleep as well, but those dreams tend not to be dreams in how we fundamentally understand dreams to be. So in REM sleep, dreams typically tend to have a narrative structure. They're like a plot evolving in our minds. They're what we describe as dreaming. And uh, REM sleep occurs in several periods over the course of the night. Can you see my cursor there on your screens? 
Sorry, you're all silent. So somebody nod yeah, or shake their head. Can you see it? Yeah, we can. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so REM sleep occurs in periods throughout the night. On average, it occurs four or five times a night. And during REM sleep, which stands for rapid eye movement sleep, um, we are um, in a very unusual state in that when we look at the brain waves of somebody in REM sleep, it actually looks very similar to the waking brain. So, so from a neurological perspective, the brain looks to be almost awake. From a physical perspective, we are completely paralyzed. Every single muscle in our bodies ha develops a, a paralysis within it, apart from the muscles of respiration, for obvious reasons, and also the muscles that control our eye, eye movements, which is why this type of sleep is called rapid eye movement sleep, because that's the stage of sleep during which our eyes are flicking back and forth. But we should be completely paralyzed. What we know is that in REM sleep behavior disorder, those mechanisms of paralysis, of paralysis of our muscles, don't work for whatever reason. And so what you should be seeing, so this is the uh, EEG, this is the, the brain waves of somebody who's in REM sleep. Uh, these, are, uh, sen these are the sensors that measure eye movements and detect those rapid eye movements that characterize rapid eye movement sleep. And then these are electrodes placed on the legs. And what you should be seeing is a nice flat line, a complete absence of electrical activity. But instead, what you see is these very large, um, frank movements and ongoing electrical activity in those muscles, which should not be there. And this is really what REM sleep behavior uh, disorder is. It's the presence of movement during dreaming sleep, resulting in people acting out their dreams. Um, so, I'm just going to show you a couple of examples of what this looks like in, uh, in, in, in non-cartoon versions. What you can see here is somebody in our lab who is in REM sleep. And you can see that he lashes out and hits the bedside cabinet. Those bedside cabinets are really rather heavy uh, and he almost topples it. This is another individual in our lab um, who is once again in rapid eye movement sleep. And you can see he give, kicks the base of the, the bed with really quite some force. And if you look at his hand movements, there are, 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 are some uh, waving hand movements which are rather characteristic of, of REM sleep behavior disorder. When he was woken up, he, he recalled a dream of being on a beach and being attacked by uh, somebody and he was fighting back. Now, a lot of these uh, dreams that people recall often have a violent nature to them, um, but they're not invariably violent. So this person here, I don't know if you can see, he was doing something uh, strange with his hand. Actually, what he was doing was he was having a gunfight and using his hand as a, as a, as a gun. Um, you're violent in some respects, but not quite physically violent in the same way as some of the other videos that I've illustrated. Uh, and in fact, if one looks at the literature, there are uh, case reports of individuals doing some really unusual things that are not violent at all. So, for example, individuals who've dreamed that they were in the shower and are singing in their sleep because they would normally sing in the shower. There is a case report from uh, uh, one of the uh, Paris groups of somebody who was uh, uh, lying in bed, uh, flapping their arms and quacking whilst making siren noises because in their dream they were a police duck chasing a burglar. Um, so, so really, you know, rather unusual. What's, what's fascinating, well, the, I think the first thing to say is that this is something that is incredibly common in Parkinson's disease. There appears to be some disagreement as to how common it is, but this is something that is very frequently seen in, in Parkinson's disease. Um, the the um, second thing to say is that when people with Parkinson's disease exhibit this kind of behavior, Actually, their paucity of movement, their tremor, is usually not evident. They move almost normally. And so individuals who are really badly afflicted, for example, with a very quiet voice or slow speech, when they exhibit this kind of behavior, they speak with a, a, a clear voice, they shout out loudly, they don't exhibit a tremor, um, they um, uh, can move uh, relatively freely. And I think that that tells us something about the organization of the brain, which if we have time, uh, we can uh, we can talk about, but the question arises as to why this occurs in in, in Parkinson's disease. And it, you know, this is this is uh, the um, 
this is not a human brain, this is a rat brain, but essentially what this demonstrates is that there are a number of areas in the brainstem um, which are involved in the generation of this muscle paralysis in REM sleep. So when REM sleep is switched on, these uh, nuclei become more active, they send projections, uh, nerve cells uh, project down into the spinal cord, and, and, and through these uh, circuits, they actually generate that, that muscle paralysis. And so we think that what happens in Parkinson's disease is that somehow the, this circuitry down in the brainstem is uh, disrupted. Something about Parkinson's disease disrupts the, the, the fundamental neurological mechanisms that mediate this paralysis. Um, but actually, it's perhaps even more... Um, the, the question about the association between REM sleep behavior disorder and Parkinson's disease is, is uh, of more fundamental importance because we're now beginning to understand that what we thought of as being idiopathic, so there are many people who exhibit REM sleep behavior disorder without any features of Parkinson's disease. Uh, these individuals were thought to have uh, uh, an idiopathic uh, uh, disorder, i.e. meaning that we don't understand what causes it and we don't understand any associations. What we now understand is that actually REM sleep behavior disorder is a frequent herald of brain disease and that individuals will often exhibit this kind of behavior sometimes years or even decades before they go on to develop Parkinson's disease or other associated conditions, conditions like um, uh, multiple system atrophy or dementia with Lewy bodies. And if one follows up individuals with isolated REM sleep behavior disorder for long enough, uh, a very high proportion, somewhere in the region of between 70 and 90% uh, develop Parkinson's disease or one of these associated uh, conditions. Um, and uh, this is a, a, a fundamental importance, particularly when it comes to trying to identify drugs that may slow the progression of Parkinson's disease or even prevent it. Because if you identify a disease modifying drug, you really want to try an individuals uh, in whom uh, the pathological process, the process underlying their disease is at a very early stage before there are, there are more obvious manifestations of Parkinson's disease. So REM sleep behavior disorder is, is a crucial marker of early Parkinson's disease. And we think that the, the presence of REM sleep behavior disorder increases your risk of Parkinson's disease compared to age match controls by about 50 times. So it's a really very strong marker for this group of conditions. Um, and in fact, uh, uh, there are already some discussions about disease modifying drugs being utilized in individuals at high risk as identified by the presence of REM sleep behavior disorder. That's one of the projects that we're currently working upon. So why, why should this be the case? Well, we know that when one looks at um, the um, when, we, when one looks at the progression of the pathological changes, the changes are under a microscope. Um, in the brains of individuals with Parkinson's disease and related conditions. But it's only when those pathological changes occur within the basal ganglia, within the areas of the brain that are responsible for regulation of movement, that, that individuals start exhibiting the motor symptoms that we mo or the motor features that we most uh, um, uh, associate with Parkinson's disease. But if one looks at individuals earlier on in the disease process, then um, they um, develop these uh, histological changes, these pathological changes within the brainstem. So this is the very area of the brain that is involved in the regulation of uh, the muscle paralysis that I was talking about in REM sleep. So when one looks at the progression of these brain changes, one begins to understand why uh, REM sleep behavior disorder may well occur. Sorry, I've got a little interloper here. My daughter has just come in. Do you want to do you, want to, do, you, do you want to get outside? Sorry. Um, I, 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 I would put her on, but I think she's a bit camera shy. Um, so, so, so one would, um, one begins to understand why this condition may be manifest um, sometimes years or even decades before Parkinson's disease itself starts. So what about the treatment of this condition? Well, there are a variety of treatments. The standard treatment is a, a sleeping tablet called clonazepam. One of the difficulties with clonazepam is that um, it can 
a cause significant sedation, which obviously in people who are potentially physically frail is not so uh, uh, helpful, uh, and it can worsen confusion. And in the last few years, there's been a, a, a move towards the use of melatonin uh, as a treatment. Melatonin, many of you will be familiar with, is the hormone that is produced by a gland in the brain called the pineal gland that is a chemical signal to the brain that it's time to go to sleep. But what we also understand is that melatonin receptors exist throughout the brain. And whilst we do not fundamentally understand how melatonin influences REM sleep behavior disorder, we now uh, uh, clearly see that melatonin is very useful in about 50% of individuals. In our center, we often see individuals with REM sleep behavior disorder who have already tried melatonin and clonazepam uh, uh, without benefit. And there are a number of what I term non-approved treatments. I always hesitate to put these in, in, in presentations because uh, they are difficult to get hold of uh, and are somewhat controversial that can uh, make a significant difference. So some of these drugs are more routinely used in conditions like, um, uh, like narcolepsy. Uh, I, I think a fundamental uh, importance is uh, the use of um, safety measures because uh, there are, as I've already alluded, there are significant safety issues uh, with regard both to the individual who's suffering REM sleep behavior disorder. I, you know, I've seen people break uh, their limbs or, or cut themselves on glass when they've lashed out and hit something uh, at the bed, on the bedside table or uh, the bed partner. So making sure that individuals who have significant REM sleep behavior disorder sleep in separate beds. Sometimes a bolster is, is sufficient, but sometimes separate beds are required. One of the key features of REM sleep behavior disorder is that compared to other sleep disorders, individuals don't tend to get out of bed and walk around in the middle of the night. And so even just sleeping in separate uh, single beds uh, a few feet apart is sufficient to uh, keep people protected. Uh, removing anything around the bed that might uh, cause an injury or, or for individuals who are falling out of bed uh, using either cot sides or putting the mattress on the floor. The other thing that is really important is to identify other sleep disorders that might be contributing uh, some of those other sleep disorders that I'm going to go on to um, discuss. And it's also important to understand that REM sleep behaviour disorder can be triggered or exacerbated by some medications that are commonly used in Parkinson's disease. Conditions that are primarily used to control anxiety, conditions, uh, treatments like the SSRIs. And uh, it, it's always worth reviewing the need for uh, antidepressant drugs in somebody who has significant difficult to treat REM sleep behavior disorder. So what about restless leg syndrome? So restless leg syndrome is a neurological disorder that's very common in the general population. It, in, it affects between five and 10% of the adult population. But in Parkinson's disease is significantly more common and is described in up to 20% of individuals. Restless leg syndrome is characterized by an urge to move a body part. So typically the legs, it's actually a bit of a misnomer because RLS or restless leg syndrome can affect any body parts, although the legs are the most common. These, this urge to move the legs is often associated with a variety of unpleasant sensations and individuals can describe a buzzing, a fizzing, uh, a, a itching or even pain that is relieved by movement and is worsened by immobility. Importantly, it's under circadian influence, which means that these symptoms are typically worse uh, in the evening or at night and are usually significantly better during the day. And that's really of crucial importance because restless leg syndrome can often be associated, can often be mistaken for other uh, causes of symptoms in, in, in the lower limbs of which individuals with Parkinson's disease are at increased risk. Things like positional discomfort, cramping or, or, or dystonia. And so it's really important that this diagnosis is made uh, in individuals in whom all those uh, diagnostic criteria are, are met. Why, why do we think it's commoner in Parkinson's disease? Is it directly linked to Parkinson's disease? Well, I think the general view, although this remains controversial, is probably not. One of the issues is that, Parkin, that restless leg syndrome can sometimes be made worse by the very drugs that are used to treat restless leg syndrome and Parkinson's disease, the DOPA agonists or levodopa in a phenomenon called augmentation. So when these drugs are used in restless leg syndrome, they're used at very low doses. And the reason for that is because we know that when the doses are increased, 
restless leg syndrome gets significantly worse. So we think that actually, uh, whilst individuals with Parkinson's disease uh, probably have the same predisposition to restless leg syndrome as the normal population, it's the fact that they have very high doses of these drugs circulating in their systems that produces clinically significant restless leg syndrome. So how do we manage uh, uh, restless leg syndrome? Well, it's about making sure that any medications that they're on that may exacerbate RLS are withdrawn. Drugs like antidepressants, uh, SSRIs, um, uh, antihistamines, a lot of drugs that are actually prescribed for individuals to help their sleep can actually worsen restless leg syndrome. Is their iron level normal? So one of the fundamental associations between RLS and systemic abnormalities is uh, low levels of iron or abnormal kidney function. And then uh, if those issues have been addressed, whether or not individuals need specific medications that might treat the restless leg syndrome. One of the things that is not frequently recognized is that RLS is associated with another neurological condition called periodic limb movement disorder. These are individuals who kick very frequently at night. And this can result in unrefreshing sleep, but also sleep maintenance insomnia. So this is exactly the problem that individuals with Parkinson's disease frequently experience in that they find that their sleep is very disrupted overnight. And what is sometimes put down to simply being a manifestation of Parkinson's disease actually has an alternative explanation, which is this presence of these recurrent leg movements throughout the night that are disrupting sleep quality. And then, um, the other condition that affects people with Parkinson's disease, um, but is very common anyway, and there remains some controversy as to whether or not it's seen more frequently in people with Parkinson's disease, is obstructive sleep apnea. So obstructive sleep apnea is a respiratory disorder that affects sleep. It results from partial or complete collapse of the airway during sleep. So our airway is held open by a series of, of muscles. And as we enter into sleep, those muscles uh, develop a, a, a reduction in their tone, in their tension. And so the airway itself here at the back of the throat becomes more floppy, the tongue moves backward a little bit, and so this airway becomes a little bit more narrowed, which results in, for individuals who are predisposed to obstructive sleep apnea, this airway partially or completely collapsing when you take a deep breath in. When there is a very minor collapse of the airway and there is turbulent flow, this results in snoring. But in individuals with significant obstructive sleep apnea, the airway is blocked sometimes 10, 15, even 100 times an hour, resulting in significant disruption of sleep quality. Because each time the airway collapses, your oxygen levels drop, your heart rate increases, there is a degree of arousal from sleep the tension returns to the muscles of the throat, the airway opens, and then that cycle continues over and over again. Uh, and obstructive sleep apnea really is one of the major contributors to marked daytime sleepiness, but in some individuals it can present as insomnia. We used to think that, that severe sleepiness during the day was really one of the few manifestations of obstructive sleep apnea, but we know that in some individuals it can result in significantly disrupted sleep. It is associated with being overweight, but not exclusively so, and so weight loss will help. But other treatments include mandibular advancement devices. These are like little boxes, gum shields that push the lower jaw forward and create a bit more space at the back of the throat. And the gold standard is a treatment called CPAP or APAP, which is a mask that is clamped to the face uh, that is attached to a small machine that generates positive air pressure. And that positive air pressure keeps the airway open and stops it collapsing. For individuals who can tolerate it, it's a, it's a life-changing uh, treatment. Now, I've already uh, discussed uh, daytime sleepiness and its association with uh, obstructive sleep apnea, but we know that excessive daytime sleepiness is very common in individuals with Parkinson's disease, even without obstructive sleep apnea or any of the other sleep conditions that I've discussed. It affects about a third of individuals with Parkinson's disease and although it is uh, usually something that we see in the latter stages of Parkinson's disease, it may occasionally occur even in the prelude to any other features of Parkinson's disease. It's likely to be multifactorial, and I'm sure that David will discuss some of the uh, issues surrounding Parkinson's disease and poor sleep quality. 
but it seems that at least in part it is associated to changes that occur within the sleep regulating centers of the brain uh, and in fact even over the last 10 years um, uh, this has become more apparent in that when i first started in the field of sleep medicine it was said that individuals with parkinson's disease often have uh, narcolepsy narcolepsy type 2 so this is a central nervous system disorder that results in frequent sleep attacks a disruption of the regulation of dreaming sleep and whilst we no longer think that that's the case, we now do understand that in some individuals with Parkinson's disease, there are changes within um, a, a series of circuits, in particular one uh, circuit that is um, regulated by a neurotransmitter called orexin or hypocretin. This is the same neurotransmitter that is implicated in narcolepsy. So uh, individual, certain subgroups of individuals seem to have a very, uh, narcolepsy like picture with uh, sleep attacks and these sleep attacks affect up to about 14 percent of individuals with uh, with parkinson's disease with about um, about one in a hundred to four in a hundred individuals with parkinson's disease reporting sleep attacks that are sufficiently severe in uh, to the extent that they can occur whilst they're driving so how do we uh, treat excessive daytime sleepiness? Well, a lot of it is surrounding what we term sleep hygiene. This is a term that I absolutely detest, but it's understood by, by uh, other clinicians. This is uh, surrounding the behaviors um, that are uh, conducive to a good night's sleep, avoidance of caffeine, avoidance of excess alcohol, making sure that your bedroom is dark um, and, and, and quiet, that you're comfortable. It's about addressing any other sleep disorders that are present. Conditions like obstructive sleep apnea and periodic limb movement disorder can give rise to excessive daytime sleepiness. We utilize planned naps quite a lot. This is uh, something that is used in narcolepsy as a very effective treatment to regulate the excessive daytime sleepiness, and it does help individuals with Parkinson's disease as well. We know that um, many of the uh, drugs used in Parkinson's disease can, in some individuals, uh, result in uh, sleepiness, sometimes sleepiness throughout the day, sometimes frank sleep attacks. And these are these include drugs like the dopa agonists, in particular, these are the main culprits, but also even drugs like levodopa. And so if there is a suggestion that somebody's excessive daytime sleepiness might be related to an increase in dopaminergic stimulation, it's certainly worth considering reducing your dopamine stimulating drugs that you're on. Um, obviously, there are significant implications in terms of safety, in terms of driving. Anybody who is excessively sleepy, regardless of whether or not they have another uh, uh, medical disorder, should not be driving. And if one is excessively sleepy, then one should not be driving under any circumstances. And then the final uh, thing that we uh, do uh, increasingly frequently is utilize stimulant drugs to keep people awake. Drugs like modafinil are uh, sometimes very effective in um, keeping people awake when they have uh, marked daytime sleepiness. They don't work for everyone. Uh, and whilst modafinil is a very good stimulant, it's not the most potent. The, one of the difficulties with more potent um, stimulant drugs is that they can often worsen anxiety or they're associated with increased cardiovascular risk, which obviously in people with Parkinson's disease is more likely purely because of the fact that Parkinson's disease tends to be, not invariably, but tends to be a condition that increases with age, as does cardiovascular risk. So we are a little bit more reticent to use stronger stimulant drugs uh, in uh, older individuals, but uh, we will sometimes um, do that. So at this point, I'm going to stop because I'm sure uh, David is going to talk a lot more on some of these issues. Um, it's now a good time to have some questions if there are any. Yeah, there is. There are some questions. Um, I think one of them is actually. Ooh, I'm be, uh, um, I have to move my because it's oh dear oh dear. One of the questions was: um, Does does the sleeplessness have uh, effect on heart disease? That came from Andrew. Yeah. So 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 I think that this is an evolving field. We 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 know that. Um, uh, sleep deprivation, so inadequate sleep, 
is associated with cardiovascular disease, as is obstructive sleep apnea. Now, now the issue surrounding insomnia is a little more complicated because what we know is that for the majority of individuals, uh, uh, insomnia does not seem to be associated with uh, increased cardiovascular risk unless you have insomnia with a very short sleep time. Now, one of the difficulties with insomnia is that the subjective exper experience of sleep in insomnia and the objective measurement of sleep are all, often widely varied. Uh, and, and so many individuals will say, well, I didn't sleep a wink at all last night, but actually when we measure their sleep, they got seven, seven and a half hours sleep on the basis of their brain waves. And so for those individuals, it appears that there is no significant increased risk of cardiovascular disease. For those individuals in whom we objectively demonstrate that they are sleeping three or four hours a night, yes there is. Um, um, another, another one that's come up is, um, is an alternative which controls, is liver dopa is a common culprit and is there any alternative which controls symptoms without impairing sleep? Does Cinemet so, slow release help? Um, well I, I, I think um, it, to, to some extent, uh, as I've already said, it seems to be that the dopa agonists are bigger culprits than levodopa for, um, for generating uh, daytime sleepiness, although levodopa is implicated. Uh, the, so there may be a, a, a peak effect, uh, although it, it's uh, very varied. So in some individuals, levodopa is actually quite stimulating. And so sometimes it is a degree of trial and error. But generally speaking, if somebody presents with marked daytime sleepiness, then I think the first the first thing to do is to see whether or not that is correlated with any drug changes, reverse those drug changes, see if they get better, uh, and then consider whether or not there might be an alternative explanation, like, for example, um, uh, 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 one of the sleep disorders that I've discussed uh, in, in my slides. Right. Um... I think there's there's some there's some more more interest in medication. Um, so, is it or is it is it there's the sleepiness associated with the disease itself or with the medication perhaps? Which I think you are already answered. Yeah, I, to think, some I, I think the answer is both. Yeah. yeah. Um, and is there any alternative which controls symptoms without impairing sleep? There's you know is any medication seems to be a big a big issue um, on, in the questions. Yeah, I, I mean, uh, you know, as I've already said, I think it's it's very variable, uh, and you know, for some individuals, um, uh, levodopa or, or or the dopa agonists make absolutely no difference to sleep whatsoever, uh, and so it really needs to be worked through with your clinician to see whether or not uh, it, it's felt that those drugs are responsible for your sleep disturbance or not. It's very difficult to give you a, a sort of a general rule. Uh, but certainly, uh, you know, if if you have noted that you are becoming increasingly sleepy and drugs like ropinarol, uh, uh, retigotine or pramipexol have recently been increased, then the first thing that I would do with a patient that I was looking after with Parkinson's disease would be to reverse that step and see whether or not um, that helps. Now, uh, you know, drugs like slow release preparations of levodopa and retigotine certainly seem to be uh, uh, less associated with conditions like uh, RLS and augmentation of RLS. So this is the phenomenon of making RLS worse. And, and certainly if somebody's got very bad uh, restless leg syndrome or periodic limb movement disorder, then I would certainly consider moving towards more slow release preparations. Now, one of, one of the things that I'm sure David is going to talk about is some of the other problems that people with Parkinson's disease experience at night and how those can be uh, uh, addressed by changing the preparation of anti-Parkinsonian medication uh, uh, before bed. Um, I think now, if, if, if I may, maybe we, we could hand over to David at some point because I'm sure he would like, he would be able to answer some of the questions that, they, that have been asked to you. Um, and are, are you okay to stay with us for a while? Yeah, I'm afraid I'm going to have to go into the hospital now because of uh, a slight change in on call. OK, but well, can I thank you very, very much indeed for, for your very, very comprehensive talk. Um, would you like me to put, would you like us to put on the website 
your book or is that suitable for, for lay people uh, to read? It it, it, it's, suit, it's suitable for lay people. Um, if it, it, I, I'm always delighted. Thank you. As I said, if you want a job as an agent, um, I, I'll email you later, Ruth. Oh, marvellous. Um, yeah. Thank you very yeah, we'll, much. We'll put some details and put, maybe put some details of stuff that can be your channel four piece on sleep so they can get okay. it on catch up. Thanks, Thanks very right. much. Thank Bye. you very much indeed. Thank you. Bye. So um, listen, it's great to be here. Thanks to Marta and all of yourselves for, for the invite. So it's nice to speak to the East of England group because as you said, I did a PhD with Roger Barker and team in the Brain Repair Center. And I actually half wondered, would I, would I know some of you? Because I did some research projects as part of the picnics and the icicle studies that I, I suspect some of you are, are, are part of. And actually I think this initiative with the research interest group meetings, I mean, it, is a fantastic one. We, we have something similar here up in Edinburgh um, that, that, that I think is hugely valuable. And I know, I know Roger's always been very keen and I did a lot of branch talks when I, when I was up doing the PhD. So listen, it's great, to, it's great to, 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 to connect remotely. So to take things on then, I mean, I think Guy has given a good overview on the sleep disorders that can impact on people's night um, if they have Parkinson's. And, and I think what you probably gleaned from what he said is that part of the challenge is in, in someone who comes in saying my sleep is rubbish is understanding what it is that's driving that bad sleep in that individual because the treatment is completely different depending on what the cause of the sleep disruption is. And what I'm actually going to go on to discuss, I think, is people without the kind of sleep disorders that we've heard about, because I think REM sleep behavior disorder, sleep apnea, you know, periodic limb movements, they're recognizable problems with particular treatments. And actually what I want to talk about a little bit more is probably the more common scenario, which is when people don't have those issues, but they have really bad sleep, the difficulty getting to, but more importantly, staying asleep at night. And I think that's probably in relation to sleep, the most common complaint. Um, I think it goes without saying, or, or maybe it doesn't, that that can be due to um, other Parkinson's symptoms, which could be the nocturnal motor symptoms as the medication is wearing off. And I'll talk a bit about that when I come, come on to treatment, but, but people can have nocturnal wearing off with difficulty moving in bed, stiffness, pain, tremor, that can make it difficult to get to and stay asleep. But I think the effect of the Parkinson's medications can have a big effect sometimes, and there's sometimes alterations required in relation to that. And there can be other non-motor symptoms um, that can impact on sleep. But I think even on top of that, and we're getting complex here, I think there is a fundamental change to people's body rhythms and sleep-wake rhythms in Parkinson's that, you know, people come and say, my sleep's rubbish, I'm not in pain, I'm moving fine, I'm not having nocturnal wearing off, I still can't sleep very well. So that's kind of what I want to discuss a little bit about. And then maybe at the end, I have a few slides on kind of treatment approaches, things that you should consider to try and improve sleep. But it's a common problem, but, but actually it can be quite tricky to treat um, because there is so many aspects to it. Um, I'm gonna put my slides on, um, if you bear with me for one second. Can you see the slides okay? Yeah, we can, yeah. well, thank you. So, so just, to, just to really emphasize that point, I mean, this, um, it's a busy table, don't worry too much about the detail, but this really, I think, speaks to what patients tell me in clinic, which is that their sleep is reduced and fragmented at night. So this is a, a study of about 125 patients. And in this column here, you have people without Parkinson's, here you have people with Parkinson's. And I think the key elements to take away is in people with Parkinson's, the total sleep time on average is significantly reduced compared to those without Parkinson's. The sleep efficiency, so the amount of time you're actually asleep you know, at, at night is significantly reduced compared to people without Parkinson's. And people seem to spend more time in the shallow stages of sleep because it's always disrupted and fragmented. And I think this is, these studies are done in the sleep laboratory where people are connected to the uh, brain electrodes. And so I think it just bears out what people tell us in clinic. And 
I guess the question in my mind is, well, what is it that um, may be driving this sleep disruption? You know, and is there a fundamental alteration in people's sleep-wake cycle that might be uh, responsible? Because our bodies have a 24-hour rhythm, not just sleep, but actually that goes for temperature and cardiovascular function and a variety of things. And, and that 24-hour rhythm is, is tuned to the the, the world around us and um, it, it's influenced by things like light and temperature and, and, and food um, and so that controls a lot about our body functions now before I go on to just talk a little bit about how that can be disrupted in Parkinson's there's a part of the brain here which is called the SCN the suprachiasmatic nucleus so I'll call that the, C, the, the SCN from now on this is basically the key master circadian clock if you like in the brain it's located in part of the brain called the hypothalamus and it coordinates our body rhythms and brain rhythms and so it's the master pacemaker if you like it's tuned to the world around us and it's it's our brains you know kind of master pacemaker and it influences the clock throughout the body and it does that in a variety of different ways but one of the ways it does it is to influence the output of certain hormones uh, including melatonin that guy mentioned a while ago which is a hormone that's intricately linked with 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 sleep regulation um, and so actually we can measure these hormones in the blood believe it or not uh, in people who are sleeping uh, to see whether their output and therefore the people with Parkinson's um, kind of circadian rhythms may be disrupted. You can actually also do other uh, fancy stuff looking at, at genetic expression of specific genes in the blood um, to, to also see if it's disrupted. I won't talk too much about that, but actually looking at hormones can be quite valuable. And there's two reasons. Uh, this is a study we did actually in Cambridge, so it's useful to, to present it here. Uh, I don't even know if anyone possible someone was even part of it in the call um, because we recruited heavily from the local branch. Um, but I think the results are interesting. So this was a study where we took 30 people with Parkinson's and 15 people without and they were all kind of matched and they didn't have the primary sleep disorders that Guy mentioned, but they had the, um, the, the Guy mentioned. And we put them into a clinical research facility, a big room. We controlled the light and the temperature and the food intake and everything we could. And we sampled their blood every 90 minutes over 24 hours to map out the hormonal rhythm over the 24 hour period to see if there was any evidence that the circadian clock was, was disrupted. And so what we found was, which I think is interesting, if you look at the controls here in the dark color, what you see is that um, the melatonin, sorry, my, my point has gone away. The melatonin bobs around at a low level until about nine o'clock and then it peaks. Um, and that's associated with sleep onset. And it peaks uh, at its highest about midnight and then it starts to kind of fall again. And that's a kind of normal melatonin rhythm. And what you see in Parkinson's is actually the, the curve looks kind of roughly similar, but the amplitude of the peak is significantly less. So there's almost like this blunted melatonin um, uh, response. And that's interesting because actually another group in Boston who were, were looking at this as well found exactly the same thing. And actually we published our uh, articles almost side by side in the same issue of the journal. You know, this is five, six years ago. And so we both wondered whether melatonin may be telling us something about the, the, the body rhythms in Parkinson's and may be responsible, at least in part, for some of the sleep disruption we were, we were uh, observing in our patients. And, and it's not, I think, restricted to Parkinson's. I think we do see melatonin alterations in other conditions which also have significant sleep problems. And so Huntington's disease and Alzheimer's dementia which can also be associated um, with sleep disruption. We, 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 other other uh, groups have also seen this disrupted, blunted melatonin rhythm, uh, which may be relevant. And so what I guess the question then you ask is, you know, well, why might it be that this melatonin um, output is, is, is blunted? Melatonin, as Guy mentioned, is, is secreted by the pineal gland in the brain. 
but it's influenced by that SCN, that part of the brain I mentioned before, the suprachiasmatic nucleus. So what we wondered was whether um, the SCN was degenerating because of the Parkinson's and it was essentially not um, stimulating sufficient melatonin production from the pineal gland. And so we did this brain imaging study where we took people with Parkinson's, with, uh, uh, with Parkinson's and without Parkinson's, and we actually assessed on their brain scan the hypothalamus, the area within which is the, the, the suprachiasmatic nucleus, the SCN. And, and kind of in line with what we, we thought we might see, what, um, we found that the people with Parkinson's had significantly reduced volume of this part of the brain. And actually that corresponded to their melatonin uh, output. And the, actually these, the, these individuals were the same ones who we'd previously studied in the, in the, in the research facility. So we, we were able to correlate the brain imaging with their melatonin output. And other people have even looked at this in um, brain tissue in people with Parkinson's who've died of other causes many, many years later, one hopes. And the same kind of pattern is seen is that the, in this SCN region, this master pacemaker region, um, very commonly there is uh, Parkinson's pathology. And so I think there's reasonable reason to believe that the Parkinson's pathology in the brain is, is influencing the, the brain's body clock and is probably influencing melatonin output. But actually, I think the P Parkinson's pathology in the brain is probably in influencing other things as well. There's other studies I've not shown here, which has shown Parkinson's pathology affecting multiple brain regions that are tightly implicated in sleep regulation and, and sleep maintenance. And so I wanted just to uh, touch upon some of that, and I hope I've given the idea that in addition to the primary sleep disorders that we've heard about from Guy, in addition to the you know, regular Parkinson's problems that give rise to sleep issues in Parkinson's, and we can, I'm, I'm gonna come on to talk about them, I think there is this separate fundamental alteration in the sleep-wake cycle that actually is due to the Parkinson's itself. And arguably that is the hardest to treat because you can't get in and take away that pathology necessarily, although there sometimes are ways that you can support or treat in different ways. And this is a very active area of interest for pharmaceutical companies who are trying to find different circadian regulators that they might be able to boost or alter. And I know that there's at least two companies and probably many, many more that are, are, are developing compounds to that, to, to, uh, for that reason. But if I can maybe take it back to a more kind of, I don't want to say simplistic level, but actually kind of common sense clinical level, maybe I can start if, if we're thinking about treatment of going back to basics. Because actually it certainly is the case, I've talked about all these hormones and body rhythms and so on, but actually quite often it is park, other Parkinson's symptoms that, in, that, that are influencing sleep. And I think that that's the starting point. Once you've, once you've excluded the things that Guy was talking about, our REM sleep behavior disorder, sleep apnea, those things, I think the first thing to exclude is, um, is there nocturnal wearing off movement symptoms at night? By which I mean tremor, by which I mean difficulty moving in bed or pain or stiffness. And this is very common, I would say, and it's, it's, it's common because, you know, generally if people are on, even if they're on fairly complex daytime medication regimes, actually people are often taking the last dose of medication, you know, at six, seven, eight o'clock at night. Um, they might be going to bed at 11 or 12 or maybe earlier, but actually it's a long, it's a long night without medication, a long time for the medication to, to kind of wear off. And in people where there's very clear nocturnal wearing off symptoms, there's definitely a role to play for slow release preparations of levodopa um, or, or potentially and uh, slow acting dopamine agonists. And, and the reticotine patch is probably the most convenient of the long acting agonists because you can put the patch on and leave it for 24 hours. But actually there are slow release versions of rapinerol, 
pramipexol as well that can sometimes be helpful. We've heard separately that those dopamine agonists can induce daytime sleepiness though. So that's why when people come saying, I've got bad sleep, you do need to take the full sleep history to understand what they mean by that. Because only then I think can you actually target and treat the right thing, if that makes sense. I think I think probably treating the, the nocturnal motor dysfunction, therefore, is probably the most important aspect of, 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 of treatment, in some people at least. But it's not the be-all and end-all. Some people say they don't have any nocturnal wearing off, and actually you need to look at other things potentially. So you need to try and make sure you've treated nocturia, the diff, you know, people getting up to pee due to their Parkinson's or just due to a, 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 you know, a, a urological issue a bladder or a, or, or, you know, or a urological issue. Um, and that's particularly common in men um, with prostatism and so forth. And so sometimes anticholinergic medication, as long as it doesn't give side effects, can be useful to treat nocturia so that that's not waking someone up at night. I think I've mentioned before that trying to, you know, in, in some people at nighttime, there can be, and not always clearly, but there can be visual misperceptions or anxieties or other um, psychiatric symptoms or cognitive symptoms or other non-motor symptoms that can actually impact on people getting to sleep. And sometimes they need separate treatment um, that can help sleep. So I think there, there, there is something about treating Parkinson's triggers. I think there's also something, uh, and it's also very important, I would say, treating and eliminating some of the medication triggers. And that's sometimes easier said than done. I think we've touched upon the fact that I think sometimes high doses of uh, levodopa in a funny way can be stimulating, even though they can treat the movement symptoms. Um, but I think they're usually necessary. But I think there are certain Parkinson's medications that many of you won't be on, but some of you might, that can certainly impact on, on people's quality of sleep. Um, they can be quite stimulating basically. So selegiline is a drug, a monoamine oxidase inhibitor that's often given to prolong the action of levodopa in people with wearing off during the day. And if, if that's given too late in the day, um, that can certainly be stimulating. It almost produces amphetamine-like metabolites. And so it should always just be given in the morning, either five or 10 milligrams, never later in the day. And amantadine is another drug that some people are on as an anti-dyskinesia agent. And amantadine also can be stimulating. And so it should really be morning and lunchtime only and avoiding it later in the day. I think more generally, I think trying to avoid or minimize caffeine later in the day, and in some people that can be anything beyond you know mid afternoon onwards they they know what they know that it affects their sleep if they have caffeine or alcohol kind of after that uh, point and alcohol can certainly affect people's uh, sleep as can actually just large meals <laughs> um but i think caffeine particularly i think has a kind of an effect and i don't just mean you know coffee that can be tea that can be other products um, and I think avoiding diuretics later in the day. I mean, some people are on diuretics for heart conditions um, to, to pee out the excess fluid, excess fluid. But clearly, if you're on that later in the day, you're going to be up peeing at night. And that's not a good thing for your, your sleep quality. So these are kind of common sense approaches that you would work through with your neurologist uh, and that I would typically go through with people I looked after who are having sleep problems. It would be a good starting point in addition to considering the other things. I think, I guess, these are other kind of common sense tips, and this is not rocket science, but I think it just, it's very important if your sleep is very bad, before kind of giving up and saying, oh, you know, it's never going to be good. I think it is on, it is, you know, it is on, on the person themselves and their bed partners to make sure they've done the required things to make sure they've done their bit. Because I've told you that our sleep is very fine tuned to the environment around us, particularly light and temperature and food and all these things. And I think minimizing those things in terms of their, their negative impact on sleep can be very important. So I think having a very regular daily rhythm can be helpful. I think if you're all over the shop in terms of long naps during the day or at night and then staying up super late and then lying in the next day, but then the following day you're kind of trying to normalize it, the brain and the body doesn't know where it's at. And trying to have a, a kind of a, a semi-normal and semi-regular rhythm I think is important. 
I think obviously having a, a dark room is important. Uh, and that kind of seems obvious, but actually it's amazing how often when you go and stay in different places, that's not the case. And so just simple things like blackout blinds and other things, uh, you know, I think is very important. I've talked a bit about motor symptoms, but even sometimes unbeknownst to people, they're having difficulty moving that's causing these little micro awakenings. And I think having a suitable, usually a hard, a harder mattress uh, and, and a suitable pillow, it seems silly and seems basic, but actually it can, these things can make a difference, especially if people have difficulty turning in bed at night. Um, avoiding bright lights and avoiding iPad, iPhone, etc. I sound like I'm sponsored by Apple or something, but in a, any phone, any a tablet. Um, I think it's important because light does uh, alter um, our body's circadian rhythm. The SCN I talked about does it, its output, it's, it, it's, it is stimulated and altered by uh, light. And I think generally just um, try not to be too hyped up leading up to bed. It's, again, it seems obvious. Avoiding spending long times in bed if you're not going to sleep. So people sometimes say, you know, make your, make your bedroom, make your bed the place you just go to sleep. So if you're spending long time in the bed, otherwise, I think psychologically that's not a good thing. And I think exercise generally during the day is something we, we sometimes get asked about. I think exercise during the day is good for sleep. Just avoiding intense exercise, I would say, very late in the day, that can sometimes have. Um, so yeah, so I think these are common sense type of um, sleep tips that I think go for anyone with insomnia. Um, combined with the more Parkinson's and medication specific mm -hmm. tips that I think can be useful. I think beyond that, in terms of medications though, which you know, sometimes I think people assume that medications, sedatives must be the answer. Mm -hmm. um, and they can, they can be helpful and we sometimes rely on them, but I hope I've given an idea that it's not all about sedatives because actually mm -hmm. if people are on big dose of tamazepam, zopatlone and so on, actually the quality of sleep often isn't the best. Um, although we do sometimes rely upon um, They're not the be all and end all. I think starting with the simple things is important. I mentioned about melatonin supplementation. Melatonin definitely is reduced in Parkinson's and particularly in people with sleep maintenance insomnia, difficulty staying asleep. For me at least, I think it's always worth trying supplementing melatonin in tablet form. Mm -hmm. So melatonin exists um, as a, a tablet called uh, circadian, slow release, mm -hmm. a two milligram pill. And I think try it, starting at two milligrams and gradually working up to eight or 12 milligrams about an hour before bedtime is always a kind of good strategy that that's an off-label use of melatonin um which actually you can buy over the counter as well or online it's not the cr form usually um, but it, but it's well recognized to be a treatment um and, and it's regulated in, in in europe for insomnia i think it's always worth trying and there is some evidence to say that maybe melatonin supplementation can help sleep um, and so I've mentioned um, a, a couple of trials here. Um, so in this, these are both sleep laboratory studies where melatonin was supplemented in different ways. So in this study, um, 60 people with Parkinson's, uh, I forget whether it was a control group or not, but were given 10 milligrams of melatonin, not the circadian, not the slow release, but just standard release melatonin, the, the, kind of, the kind you'd buy maybe over the internet for 12 weeks. And there was some improvement in sleep and other measures. And in this study, um, a smaller study, uh, 34 um, people with Parkinson's who were given smaller amount of melatonin, slow release over four weeks. Again, there was improvement in sleep and other parameters. The literature is a little bit conflicting. There have been some studies that haven't shown a brilliant um, response to melatonin, but melatonin is cheap as chips. It's very safe and it's definitely worth trying in my opinion. Because I think if you're then starting to think about other medications, um, you are getting to other medications that I think have more in the way of side effects. Hopefully the screen moved on there. I'm having some yeah. technical okay. But I mentioned hip hypnotics. So in the Movement Disorder Society guidelines for the treatment of non-motor symptoms, um, really of the hypnotics, the only one that's kind of recommended is s zopatlone which actually we don't really tend to have here in the UK. I think lots of people are on Zopatlone. Um, 
and, and so Zopatlone is a kind of sedative, maybe starting at 3.75 milligrams and increasing up to 7.5 um, if necessary. It can be helpful, although the quality of sleep isn't necessarily the same as if you were sleeping normally. And so it's always best to try these other more conservative measures, I would say. Um, some people are on temazepam. Again, as a hypnotic, as a sedative, it has sometimes a role, but clearly there are, it's a benzodiazepine drug. It's like, it's, it, it's related to diazepam. There's a risk of tolerance and dependence on the drug. And so caution is required, I would say. In people who need antidepressant medication because maybe their mood problems are a fundamental part of their Parkinson's, and that's quite common. Um, you can sometimes use the side effects of some of those drugs to your advantage in a, in a funny way. And so drugs like mirtazapine have actually a good um, and, and slight kind of sedating effect. And they can therefore have a role in helping people sleep. And, and, and sodium oxabate is, I don't think I have anyone on sodium oxabate. It's very rarely prescribed. It can cause psychiatric side effects. It's very high in salt, and so it can cause high blood pressure and cardiac problems too. It's a very strong um, sleep um, promoting drug. But I think out with very specialized sleep centers, it's probably not prescribed really much at all. But I think sometimes we, we do go to these drugs if we need to, but they're not first line. And I guess the, the final point I would just make, and, and again, it's just to make the point that there are a lot of researchers and pharmaceutical companies very interested in this area and there may be other new types of drug coming because clearly sleep problems in Parkinson's separate to what the, the, the primary sleep disorder mm -hmm. secondary to the Parkinson's itself there, there, there's a big unmet need for drugs that influence the circadian rhythm that aren't just sedative hypnotics. And there's a new class of drugs called the dualorexin antagonists that are now in early clinical trial stages. And this is a study published just, just this year about this new drug. Um, these are early stage clinical trials. These are not drugs that you can get from your clinician, but they may be drugs in the future that if they're shown to be beneficial could be available. And I know, as I say, there's other pharmaceutical companies trying to develop other drugs based around, based around other novel brain targets which look quite exciting from what I've seen. So there is a lot of research in this area because I think people recognize there's a big unmet need here. And right. so on to, to end. So thank you for listening. Do follow me on Twitter. I, like Marta, I've just got into Twitter. So do follow me. And I, I do, I do gone? tweet about sleep because it's one of my ongoing interests, particularly how sleep might actually be a risk of Parkinson's itself. Um, mm. Thank you much. Can, can, can I ask you some questions then now that have come up? Please do. Um, what, what, the, the, the drugs thing has come up again and again and again and people, people asking questions. And one of, the, one of the questions was, should you go to your GP, your consultant, your Parkinson's nurse and talk to them about these drugs? I mean, because sometimes, I mean, from my experience, sometimes consultants don't always like being questioned <laughs> necessarily. Neurologist, you mean? Yes, yes. Yeah, I mean, I th how I th would you approach it? Well, I mean, I think um, it's all, it should be a partnership, one hopes. Mm -hmm. I think the, 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 there's, there's, I think a good, it depends on the cause, first of all, I would say, of people's sleep mm -hmm. problem. I think if some, if this is, if there's sleep apnea or if there's clear things that the GPs are used to dealing with, they'll, they'll do what they normally do and get mm -hmm. the right help. I think if, if there's clearly, Parkinson's related drivers to the poor sleep and Parkinson's medications are being altered. It's the Parkinson's team who should be doing that. It's sometimes easier for the local Parkinson's nurse specialist to coordinate that. Uh, almost always that is following an email or discussion with the neurologist who sometimes is a bit more difficult to get hold of mm -hmm. very quickly. Whereas the Parkinson's nurses usually have a hotline locally, at least we mm -hmm. do in our area. Yeah. And, and, and usually when you're speaking to the nurse, you're usually speak, they are the face of the Parkinson's team mm -hmm. because you know, I'm sure it's the same in Cambridge. Mm -hmm. We work basically hand in hand with the nurses. Um, so I think, I think it's, I mean, you know, it's certainly on the radar of, all Parkinson's nurses and neurologists. Mm -hmm. um, also, I think GPs deal with a lot of insomnia mm -hmm. too. But GPs probably will be more inclined, and this is not to be disparaging, but they'd probably be more inclined to go to the hypnotics and sedatives if someone's coming in saying, I can't mm -hmm. sleep. 
and, and they'll probably advise on these conservative sleep measures, sleep hygiene measures too, mm -hmm. but they might not be quite so aware of the Parkinson's medication alterations that I've discussed. Mm -hmm. um, um, so, so, but, but certainly when you're seeing your GP, normally uh, seeing your neurologist, normally a neurologist letter has a plan A, B, C, and sometimes mm -hmm. D, E, and F, uh, mm -hmm. that a GP can then run with for mm -hmm. a while until yeah. they aren't working. And so, then, so, yeah, so, so your, your advice would be to go to the Parkinson's nurse and, and use their expertise to get, yeah, because you only see a neurologist every now and then. So that's great. And another one that's come up um, from Keith Howlett. So during REM sleep, Guy mentioned muscle paralysis occurs. Would this mean muscle contractors would be released? I presume he means after taking the correct medication. I think that's what it means. Yeah. Um, so if I get the question, if I understand the question, I mean, normally during REM sleep, apart from your eye movements, you should be, uh, apart from your, um, so your, your breathing muscles, mm -hmm. um, you should be paralyzed normally if you don't have REM sleep behavior disorder. But the problem in, in, in REM sleep behavior disorder is there is a release of that muscle atonia. So people are able to move in their dreams, whereas they, they shouldn't normally be able to. And so the drugs for REM sleep behavior disorder, um, they're actually different. It's not clear, and actually I think it differs between the drug, whether they're just reducing the amplitude of the movements, but people are still moving, mm -hmm. if it's doing something for the REM atonia itself. Um, I think what the patient and their bed partner really wants though is not to be kicked or injured at night. And so that, that you know, it, it's the practical improvement that, 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 that they're looking for. Um, you're not curing the REM sleep behavior mm -hmm. disorder. That, the, 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 the damage, if you like, or the alterations in the brain that gave rise mm -hmm. to it are probably still there. And sure they are still there. So you're basically treating the symptom with melatonin or clonazepam or, 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 or those types of drugs. Uh, but as I say, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, I don't make light of the impact RBD can have Mm -hmm. people can injure themselves they can injure their bed partner it can mm -hmm. lead to people sleeping in separate beds or uh, and so on so i think you know it, it, it's something that sometimes we kind of joke about because it looks mm -hmm. quite it sounds quite funny but actually it can have a big impact yes that, that was one of the questions actually about injury to um to oneself um another one is would it help if you take all your dopamine agonists and or levodopa medication early in the day again it's a drug question well, yeah, but you'll be stiff and rigid as a poker at night. And so, so it, it's not all or nothing. You know, you, I, 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 as, as, you're, as you're probably understanding, um, you know, sleep is part of the big picture. And, um, you know, obviously, you know, you can't treat the sleep problems in isolation. I've mentioned mm -hmm. some drugs that are definitely best to take in the morning because they have mm -hmm. a, a mode of action that can, you know, be, be prolonged during the day and you don't lose the motor benefit. Yeah. Don't worse, you don't have the side effects. Um, uh, and, and there's some drugs, like I mentioned, mirtazapine, mm -hmm. problems that can have a sedating effect that should be given at night. But I think actually for levodopa, um, I think people need it regularly during the day. Otherwise, yeah. Yeah. You have significant off symptoms that are going to be by far the main problem in driving the poor quality sleep. So people need levodopa replacement during mm -hmm. the day. Um, I, think it's, I think it's a case, uh, you know, I think I think it's just trying to work out the best timings and and yeah and, and look at the other things I've mentioned. I mean I think there's there's an awful lot of information on your slide, which is great. Um, and I, I might, might I suggest that people look at it, look at the recording again of the of the um, of the talk and go and look and talk look at the, these particular suggestions and maybe go to their consultants, their neurologists with them. And I think the kind of sorry to interrupt you. I mean I think. That's right that the some of the practical sleep suggestions I've given uh, which are kind of common sense suggestions mm -hmm. I think they are part you know there is a wider literature of just sleep hygiene mm -hmm. that term either but I think it's some of it's not Parkinson specific some mm -hmm. of it is. and yeah. I think there's no harm reading about general things you can do to what, what do they call it make your bedroom a haven for sleep or you know but, you know but, but there's things you can do basically mm -hmm. you know that are, that are good in terms yeah your body's rhythm but then there's the other more parkinson specific things that i think probably it is your doctors and your neurologist and the mm. parkinson's nurses that are going to be able to, to to help you more with 
Um, I think, are there any more questions from anyone that um, are coming up? Because I think if there's anything that anybody would like to say, we could be coming up to five o'clock now, so can, can we have anything that's urgently required as an answer from David before, before we release him into the community? If I may, I believe Jeff and Jane, which are in the audience, asked mm -hmm. what light wavelengths to oh. stimulate melatonin, white or color? I don't know if this question is related to light therapy, perhaps. Yeah, light therapy is really complex. Um, and actually there are companies now developing um, bright light therapy and developing lamps. That is, I would say, primarily a treatment for excessive daytime, um, daytime sleepiness, uh, as opposed to nighttime sleep problems. Um, in some of the studies done with bright light, there may be a rebound beneficial effect in terms of the in, in terms of the night the nighttime sleep. But primarily, I think bright light therapy is mainly about treating um, treating the. Oops, it is it. Go. Ah, oh, you're back. <laughs> you're back. I'm sorry. Am I okay? I'm just going to go. Yeah, you're, you're back now. Yeah. So I think, um, yeah, so th these are commercially available. Now, um, from memory, um, I can't remember the, the, the exact wavelengths, to be honest. Um, there's a, I'm trying to remember, as we're talking, I'm trying to remember the company that has developed it, that is now commercializing it. I, I can pass on that information to you. Uh, Good, yeah to you but there are people who are, who are interested in this and that and that has to do with I think understanding why bright light is good light is not good at night because I've just told you that you know light actually tells the suprachiasmatic nucleus mm -hmm. that it's time to be awake and actually that's not good for nighttime mm -hmm. may or may not be good for some people during the daytime but as Guy mentioned it may be as much to do with damage to particular populations of neurons, like orexin neurons. That, that may just uh, be just yeah. as important. But but I think there is interest in bright light. I think it has a role to play in people with um, excessive daytime sleepiness, where you've done everything you can mm. with medications and, and and so on. And it's, and people with excessive daytime sleepiness, they don't always have to have bad sleep at night. It's not necessarily that they're only sleepy during the daytime because they slept badly the night before. I think it can be an entity mm. on, uh, unto mm. itself. I'm, I'm going to throw in one more question, completely off my own back. How do you, what do you say about somebody taking a book and reading a couple of pages? To, would that send them to sleep? Yeah, well, I, th I think that's part of the kind of relaxation, having mm. a, 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 and a kind of relaxing routine at night time not you know you know I've spoken about trying to avoid bright light well you know what's the thing that we do just before we go to bed if you know as long as we all remember we should remember we go and we go and stand in the bathroom with a mm. brightly lit room and brush our teeth yeah these kind of things uh, so I think I think you know I, I think it is important to have a kind of relaxing you know you know um you know routine at night mm. I think that yeah I, I think that's you know Whatever, yeah. whatever does it for you. Yeah. Well, thank you ever so much. Now, um, before we say good goodbye to you, there's a, a, a feedback poll coming up. So I'm going to say that. So please stick around even after we've said thank you to David. But I would say thank you. Thank you so much. There's an awful lot of stuff that's really interesting in your slides. And I would recommend that everybody goes back and looks at the recording and, um, and, and, and takes note of what you said. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. It's really kind of you to take, take so much of your time. Oh, I know you're busy. It's my pleasure. It's nice to see you all. Thanks, Marta. Thanks, everyone. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you.